Thank you very much for having me here, and I would like to welcome everyone to the Innovation Forum and, um, and to our sort of joint task of, um, of daring to be still and daring to start innovative, new and creative conversations. And it's really my pleasure of being here. I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we stand. And for those of you who may not be from Brisbane, in the greater Brisbane area, that's the Turrbal and the Yagara people. And on this side of the River Maywa, it's in particular the Yagara peoples. Um, I acknowledge elders past and present. And I would also like very much to thank the organizers, ISQ, for inviting me, in particular, Robin Collins and Nari Tangney, and also the organizers of this great conference, Michelle and Liz. Thanks for all the support. Now, um, <clears throat> Mark, you've said I'm a conflict resolution educator. I'm also a practicing mediator and facilitator. And what I hope to do with you today is I hope to open the conversation of the Innovation Forum, and I also hope to challenge you a little bit in your thinking around education. And that's why I've entitled this presentation Opening Space. I argue that we should, as educators, open more space in our teaching, in the way we manage our education systems, and, um, and in the way we engage with every participant in this system. So I'm going to talk about some topics that sound very complex, and indeed, that's the word that I'm using, complex learning environments. But at the heart of this are always relationships. And what I hope to do here is I hope to open a conversation with you, and this is only the start of it, um, and a, a conversation in which new ideas emerge, innovation emerge. And for me, I feel very strongly that this can only happen through diverse conversations. Different people being in a room together or communicating sometimes electronically over distance, sharing ideas, sharing knowledge. And, um, and what I'm doing right now is almost the opposite. I'm actually standing here in front of you, lecturing you more or less. So maybe we'll start a little bit differently. Um, I invite you just for a minute to actually have a brief conversation on your table. Make sure if you don't know the people you're sitting with that you have a quick introduction and maybe just say to each other, what do you want to get out of the next two days? So please, go right ahead. Have a quick conversation with each other. Did you just notice what happened? I tried to bear, I tried to be, to dare to be still, and the room erupted in buzzing sounds of conversation and people engaging with each other. This is the spirit of dialogue and the spirit of dialogical education, and, um, and I'm going to try and make a case for more of that in classrooms and school environments. And the reason for that is that I believe we live in a society now that is highly complex, difficult and different. And I believe that we're actually educating in a learning environment that's very complex. And some of the traditional practices of education do not work very well anymore in dealing with this kind of complexity. So I'm going to introduce very briefly some ideas on um, complex systems and complex adaptive systems. And I will um, try to explain that I think that today's learning environment in schools is such a complex system. And then, I'll <clears throat> and then I'll explain that I think we have, in a way, three different approaches to education. A prescriptive way, an elicitive way, and a dialogical way. 
And I believe from my practice as a conflict resolution educator in universities um, that the dialogical way is a way that helps us deal better with the complexity of these environments. Let me start by talking a little bit about this very vague and amorphous idea of complex systems and systemic thinking. They're fairly new fields of science, although you could argue that um, <clears throat> their origins are at least about 70 to 100 years old. But what is the difference between a complex system and a complicated system? Let me try and give you an, an easy example. A car is a complicated system. I have no idea how my car works, what all the different parts do, but I know their purpose is to drive me from point A to point B. Many different parts come together, all the little screws, the wires, the electronic parts, the tires, the roof, the windscreen wipers, and they produce a system that, um, that serves a purpose, the purpose to drive, the purpose to keep me safe on the road, the purpose to, um, to keep me sheltered in the rain while I traverse from point A to B. Now, this is only a complicated system because you can break it down into all its component parts, like your mechanic does. You can take the car apart completely, and you can look at all the different parts, and if you understand their, um, if you understand their function and you put them together, you get the purpose of the car. Now, what happens if something miss it, is missing from that car? If the engine is missing, the car is not going to go anywhere. It, will, it won't fulfill its purpose. If the windscreen wiper is missing, it will fulfill its main purpose of driving, but it will not fulfill its secondary purpose of actually cleaning the windscreen in the rain and keeping the driver safe so that the driver can see. This is a complicated system. A complex system is different. A complex system, and you can see the pictures here, complex systems occur in nature. They evolve. Again, they have many different parts, and these parts are interrelated. But the purpose of the system and the, um, and the patterns that emerge from it cannot be predicted. I can't just look at the system and know exactly what it does. Let me give you some examples. Um, examples in nature are weather and climate systems. Even though we have some terrific technology these days, it's still impossible to, to really predict the weather for tomorrow. Another example would be an ecosystem, and this is probably also for all the biology teachers in the room. You might want to correct me here. I'm very happy to be challenged. That ecosystems, um, for example, a, a garden, um, are made up of many different species. They're made up of minerals. They're made up um, of the soil. And all, these, and all these different parts work with each other. And if you take a part away, you can actually not predict what's going to happen. Sometimes, if you take an insect species away, if an insect species is eradicated, another species will take over their role, and the garden will still function. Sometimes, a small change that seems to be almost, um, almost um, um, not necessary or, um, or seems, to be, seems to be almost superfluous can make a big difference. Take one small species away, and the whole garden could die. So in complex systems, you can have small changes with really big effects, or you, have, or you can have big changes with virtually no effects. Another example would be the human brain. And we all know um, the research and the anecdotes about stroke victims, for example, where the brain, where the synapses of the brain actually rewire themselves to some degree to actually carry out the system functions that were impaired before. So one of the important things in these systems is that it's really difficult to predict what they do. Um, <clears throat> the difference between systemic thinking and reductionist thinking is that it's not just about the, the small parts. It's also about the relationships of these parts, how they relate, what kind of feedback loops exist between them. And if we take this, these examples from biology and we actually um, we use some kind of anal analogy in sociology, we look at human systems, living systems. And, um, and I put to you that, in a way, everywhere where human beings gather and interact with each other, build, maintain, and, um, and evolve relationships, complex social systems evolve. Organizations, 
where people get together to fulfill a purpose that they cannot fulfill by themselves. Communities are complex systems. This room is a complex system made up of all of you as, some, uh, as the parts and your relationships and interactions. And of course, schools are complex systems. Let's have a look at that. The complex learning environment for schools. Now, I tried to find the system purpose of the school. And let's see how that sits with you when I say that I, I believe that schools try to prepare children or young people or anyone for their roles in an effective society. And they aim to develop their capabilities and opportunities for fulfillment. That's a system's purpose. It's about giving young people choice, letting them fulfill their destinies, their wishes, and also building a society in which people can live peacefully together and where everyone has a chance to, to fulfill their potential. And the way that schools do that is um, with a lot of different actors, parts of that system. Students, teachers, administrative staff, professional staff, parents, neighbors, community, local council. Um, I'm not working in a school, so I probably forgot half of them. Is that right? Yeah, I can see some people nodding. You can probably think of many more. And the school environments that I see are classrooms, play areas, sports fields, meeting rooms, tuck shops, school halls, auditoriums, offices, all of these and the grounds around them make up just the physical space of the school system. And then there are different learning preferences that you all know about, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, emotional, experiential. Together, that to me sounds highly complex. And, um, and my own example is whenever I am asked to do a workshop in a school and I get to the school grounds, just navigating the school grounds is a real challenge, is a complex task, and I can't do it alone. I actually normally have to ask one of the students to direct me to the office, and the lovely people in the office where I can sign in will tell me where I need to go. Someone will come and pick me up and actually navigate through the labyrinth that the school grounds pose to me. So what you get is a highly complex learning environment. And um, knowledge is created in this environment in, um, in new ways. Think of Wikipedia, Facebook, Twitter. These are all sources of information, of learning. And while schools become more complex over the years, from single teacher classrooms and small schools to the, um, to the complex environments we have today with thousands of different people who are there on the same day, society itself has also become more complex. We have more ways to communicate with each other and the number of relationships between individual people has exponentially increased through the use of online communication, for example. And this puts pressure on this school system to fulfill its purpose, to try and prepare young people for their role in this complex society. And now I want to have a look at what, how we do that, at different learning styles that we're using. And, um, and again, I invite you to challenge me. The spirit of dialogue is also that you can disagree. Don't be persuaded by me. Add your voice to my presentation, even a, either, either after this event or in the World Cafe that we're going to do later on today. Um, I'm speaking mainly from my experience as a university lecturer, and, um, and you may be doing a lot of the things that I find challenging in university already in a different way. And you may have different words and terms for that. But the way that I see it, at least at university, is that a lot of the knowledge transfer is not very complex. A lot of the knowledge transfer works like in the following picture. Some of you may recognize this. This is from Paulo Freire's um, book, um, Education for Critical Consciousness. Paulo Freire, the great Brazilian educator and philosopher and founder of critical pedagogy. And, um, and Paulo Freire strongly criticized this idea of prescriptive education. What can we see? We can see a teacher who stands in front of a large group of students and who shows them, who talks about, um, who transfers knowledge from one person to a large group. I call this prescriptive education, and, um, and I also consider this the industrial age way of transferring knowledge. It's transferring knowledge from one person to a large group of people. And it's useful for upskilling many people at the same time to build and work machinery. 
This is how you train people to work in the Ford Model T factory. You tell them all what they need to do in a large group, and then you send them out. You upscale. Paulo Freire has also called this banking knowledge. So educators prepare lessons, impart knowledge on students, and students receive that knowledge. So it's like going to the bank. Every lesson is another penny that goes into the bank. And, um, and Freire criticized this in, um, in Brazil and in Chile as dehumanizing. He, th he thought that it does not value the knowledge of the learners, and it does not take into account their needs. And um, <clears throat> one of the needs that he always came across was the need for, for the learners to actually have food. And he thought hungry people don't learn very well. So for him, it was a, a physical need of the learners that this way of banking knowledge did not, um, did not help with. I want to look at this again through this lens of complex systems and complexity. And I want to ask you, you've seen the picture. One teacher, the source of knowledge, the students receiving that knowledge. How complex is that? What's the most complex idea that the teacher can impart? What's the limit of complexity in this way of education? I think it's the complexity of the educator. It's the knowledge of the educator. The absolute limit in the banking approach is the knowledge that the educator carries and their ability to transfer that knowledge to the students. So if there's one teacher and 30 students, the complexity is the complexity of that one, this one person. You've got great teachers with large complexity, a lot of knowledge and great ability to transfer that knowledge to students, but they're still limited by that. Or you may have teachers who may not be the experts in the fields, who may not have access to all the knowledge that is required or the same understanding, and the complexity of learning will be lower. But it will always be limited by this one person, or if you have two educators working together by the team, for example. In my field, this approach has been um, criticized a lot. So a lot of people actually um, make reference to Freire, for example, and, um, and a lot of people who teach conflict resolution skills, mediation, facilitation, peace building, um, also work in different countries and in different cultures. And, um, and therefore, they have found that the expert knowledge doesn't work because the local conditions, the local social systems are different. Transferring that knowledge actually doesn't work, doesn't make sense to the learners. So in this field, um, <clears throat> the response to banking knowledge was a different approach called elicitive learning or elicitive education. This is actually from a workshop that I did a few years ago in a, um, in a school south of Brisbane. And um, <clears throat> just look at the picture. If you, you see me in there in the middle, um, what kind of education transfer is happening here? What I try to show is that I'm part of the group of learners. I'm not trying to stick out. I'm not wearing a school uniform, yes, but I'm doing exactly the same things as the students there. And um, <clears throat> so this is what I call elicitive education. Um, <clears throat> this is a conflict resolution game that we're playing there. It's an approach for cross-cultural studies and very popular in conflict resolution education. And here educators assume that the source of knowledge is not the educator. The source of knowledge are the participants, the students. All the knowledge needed is already available in the room. And it's the role of the educator to actually elicit this knowledge, to bring it out, to um, <clears throat> encourage talk, conversation, dialogue between the students so that they be can become aware and, um, and learn from each other and network with each other. This works really well for teaching social skills. It works very well also for teaching some conflict resolution skills and communication skills, because most people have an innate sense from growing up what works and how to build constructive relationships. And all we need to do is tease that out through a workshop environment. But it also has some disadvantages. So it is very much for respecting knowledge. That's what it does. 
It respects the knowledge of the participants. Educators pose problems and ask learners how to solve them. And the learners are the sources of knowledge and educators merely facilitators. It counters the dehumanizing effects of prescriptive education and it helps really to develop rapport and curiosity in people. Just like I thought you were buzzing with a bit of curiosity when I asked you to talk to each other right at the start of this presentation. But let's look again through the complexity lens. What's the complexity, the maximum complexity that is possible in this learning environment? I put to you in this little math equation that it's the complexity of the learners and their access to knowledge because they are the source of that knowledge. So you may have more complexity because you may have 20 learners in the room, but it's not just brains, it's also access to knowledge. If these 20 learners don't have the same access to knowledge as others, their um, complexity will still be limited. This is, I think, where dialogue comes in, because dialogue tries to merge the two or marry the two, it tries to marry prescription with respect, with elicitation. So the third approach that I'm suggesting here and that I hope we'll have a good discussion about how to actually implement more in schools and other education environments is dialogical education. This is a photo of a conflict resolution role play in the same school. And, um, and you can see, obviously, the students in their school uniforms. You can see me standing there. You can see another young colleague who actually, from this picture, could almost be a student in the school standing there. And, um, and in this role play, I'm actually part of the role play. So I'm part of the learning environment. The, the differentiation between who is the teacher and who is the learner is blurred. Constantly, teachers and learners swap roles and educate each other. And what does it do? I believe it actually creates knowledge. It grows knowledge. And what educators do in this style is they prepare learning activities, similar to prescriptive style, they post problems, and then they jointly discuss different views and suggestions, but they also impart their knowledge. They add their knowledge to the learning environment. So both educators and learners are sources of knowledge and they engage in dialogue. Dialogue in that way is a way of communication in which all participants explore each other's views or knowledge without the need to persuade. Both develop a spirit of inquiry and learn from each other. They acknowledge that some things need to be taught and, um, and discussed, but they start like a blank slate, like Steve has said before, and embrace that. So the educator may just as well be changed in their theory, in their thinking, by the stories that come up from the learners. Let's look at the complexity again. The complexity here is the complexity of the educators plus the complexity of learners and both of their access to knowledge. So this is where I find this a persuasive, persuasive model because it actually maximizes the possible complexity of the learning environment by adding knowledge from teachers or trainers and knowledge from participants and students. And it's held in a, um, in a tension in that people who engage in this form of dialogue actually evaluate, critique, um, and interrogate each other and each other's sources of knowledge to find creative ways forward. Educators here are facilitators who contribute knowledge when asked, but hold this lightly and, um, and invite a challenge. And when we look at all of this, all the, th the three different ideas around education, I also want to have a look about um, I also want to have a look at complex society. If society becomes more complex, that means in a way in teaching, our curricula become fuller. There's more information that needs to be taught. If you just use the banking approach, what you do is you add to the curriculum. So it's just added. Certain subjects are taught earlier to students. Um, but what happens is, at some stage, you reach the end of the complexity of a student. 
You cannot add indefinitely because there are only 24 hours in a day. School starts at 9 and ends at 3. There's only so much time to actually add to the curriculum. So unless we change our way of thinking about banking, and I'm fairly sure that there will be lots of concepts in this forum about how we can change our thinking around banking knowledge, we reach a limit there. With complexity, we also, and dialogue, we also develop problem-solving skills. We develop new pathways into knowledge. We may not always be able to actually bank as much, but we give learners the opportunity to access more. And I said before that I want to also give some practical examples, at least of how I do that, and then again see how that sits with you, and, um, and if some of these activities could work in your school and classroom environments. So there's four stories that I want to talk about, and, um, and they relate to the photos that I've shown about conflict resolution training in schools. The first activity that we, um, <clears throat> that we often do when we run a conflict resolution workshop in a school is called the River of Life. The River of Life um, is an activity where um, we ask all the students, and we engage in that as educators ourselves, to, um, to talk about our life to that point where we're in the room together, and to draw a river on a piece of paper with lots of colored pens, and to, um, and to talk about the different stages of our lives, the people that made a difference, the events that, um, that made us who we are right now, and, um, and we develop this very rich description of lives and pictures. And then we ask everyone, including the educators, to present their picture, their river of life, to the rest of the group. And, um, <clears throat> and the feedback that I've so far received from the teachers of the classes where I've run this activity is, for example, that uh, this is from um, an English teacher in a grade eight class, that this activity elicited more self-reflective information from, um, from the students in the class than any English self-reflective essay that they were asked to write. It's about drawing on the knowledge of the learners, of the participants, but at the same time we can add some of our own knowledge and even some of the curriculum that we need to teach by telling our own story as educators. And we hold it and we discuss it and we, um, and we critique it. The second activity is a World Cafe conversation. And that's what I'm going to invite you to, um, to try out with me today and tomorrow. World Cafe is a way of rebuilding complexity. It's a way of having many different conversations about the same topic at the same time, and then networking these conversations by asking the people who are part of these conversations to switch chairs and tables and talk to different people in the room. So in a way, um, it actually rebuilds the structure of a brain in the room through um, particular rounds of conversation and way of asking questions. And so far, I haven't run a World Cafe where there hasn't been at least one or two really new and creative ideas that come out of these different conversations. And um, I do this a lot with, um, with um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples, migrant refugee communities in, um, in connecting communities. And, um, and some of the results are that, um, that people come out of a World Cafe conversation, they've learned something about the other community, and they haven't just learned something, they've got the phone number of someone else. They got the phone number of someone that they can call if a conflict develops, for example, between some young people of these communities. They have, um, they have learned something about different greeting rituals and breaking down barriers, and they have had a lot of fun together. They've actually developed a constructive relationship. So World Cafe conversations are a way to, um, to provide this dialogical learning experience. The third one are body sculptures and role plays, which I use a lot in my, <clears throat> in my education um, activities. And, um, and again, they draw first on the embodied experiential knowledge of the students and the participants. But then they give the opportunity, for example, in a, in a forum theater-like environment to actually impart some knowledge from the teachers. So in a conflict resolution role play, like the one in the photo, um, I would ask students in the class to think about a conflict that happened in the school recently. And then 
to get together in groups, to discuss it, to develop a role play, to then play the role play for the class and for the group. And, um, and often these role plays are around fights. I mean, we all acknowledge that, unfortunately, destructive engagements happen in our schools. And, um, and we stop the role play, for example, in the moment before the first punch flies. And we look at how people stand in the room, and that's the moment for me then, as a conflict resolution educator, to also to ask the students where they stand, how they feel, for example, what this situation is like for them. And they often say, well, I feel uncomfortable when they're in an aggressive stance. And, um, and we can discuss this, and we can talk about that, um, that actually no one benefits from this situation. And then, <clears throat> so this is a way for me to impart the expert knowledge that I bring. And, um, and then I can ask the group, so what would you do differently? And often it's very small things. It's, um, it's for bystanders to think not to actually take a video um, of, the of the conflict with their mobile phones, but to simply move two steps further forward and stand in the way of people who could fight. It's very small things. Or instead of looking at a phone to hold up a hand and say stop. And the students themselves develop the ways of, um, of dealing with that with the knowledge that's been imparted through the role play. The last one is a bit more complicated and, um, and, and complex. And I want to see if, um, if, you can, if you can see this, if this could work in your school. This is something that I've recently used at a university. The Samoan circle is a particular way of group facilitation. And, um, and what you do in a Samoan circle is you ask, um, you ask people who are engaged in a very critical, sometimes heated discussion, um, you ask some representatives to come to a very small circle in the middle of everyone, um, probably with four chairs and two empty chairs. And you ask them to sit down and start a discussion about the particular topic. And, um, and no one in the audience is allowed to speak. Everyone is there to be still and to listen. But if members of the audience actually want to have some input, want to ask a question, or want to engage in this conversation, they can get up, sit in one of the empty chairs, and add their voice to the dialogue. What it does, it actually discourages people from sniping from the back. It encourages people to take responsibility for what they say, and it encourages everyone to listen much more closely. So this is the facilitation technique. What we used in the um, in the classroom was um, we had some fairly uh, abstract topics of theory to talk about. And, um, and um, actually, we talked a little bit about complex adaptive systems, so you can imagine how complex and abstract it was. And, um, and what we did is two of us, I worked with a, with a co-lecturer there, um, we both presented our theoretical framework, um, and we presented two different theoretical frameworks for the same topic in brief lectures, using the banking approach. This is banking knowledge. This is standing there and um, transferring knowledge from the educators to the class. And then we held the Samoan circle, and we invited two students um, to join us in the circle, and we started a dialogue where we would actually start by critiquing and criticizing each other, and, um, and pointing out the weaknesses in our frameworks. And the students joined in, and other students from the class um, joined in by standing up, coming into the circle, adding their questions, adding their voices. The feedback that we received was that this, that this was a terrific way to actually understand and grapple with and critique and problem solve the, um, the abstract theory that we had to talk about. So these are four ways of, um, of facilitating some of these learning activities. And, um, and I hope that I made a case that in a complex learning environment, these dialogical activities simply provide more options, provide more complexity to actually deal with the complexity of the situation. I also need to give some precautions, and, um, and it wouldn't be a, hopefully, fairly balanced keynote by pointing out the weaknesses of these approaches. So the precautions that I have is that there is a space for each type of educational approach. There is simply knowledge that particularly students in school do not have at the time in their lives. And there is a place for banking, and that needs to be done. And hopefully we can do it in ways that is as accessible and interesting and, um, and well thought out as possible and, um, and, um, so, that, so that students can take it into account. 
but we should look at where can we reduce the banking and try for a more dialogical approach. There are also times where we need to use a fully elicitive approach. This is, for example, um, if, there is, um, if, there is, uh, if there are students or learners uh, who may have suffered trauma before, who really, um, who really may suffer from someone standing there and telling them what to do. They're a purely elicitive approach is often the way to break down barriers, to build rapport, and to build up self-confidence. It's because through respecting knowledge, we can actually have the, the ethical message to our learners that they matter, and that they have something important to say. Often, these elicitive and dialogical approaches can prepare the ground very well for prescriptive approaches. It actually makes sense to ask the students first about their view and then to impart the knowledge. Everyone feels better when they're actually being recognized and asked for their expertise first. And then they often open up much more to receive the knowledge from someone else. So um, <clears throat> staging these approaches can help. Using dialogical approaches does not mean that educators don't have to know the subject. It's not just about facilitating conversations. Because it's only possible to provide um, learning activities and to prepare these learning activities if you know your subject matter very, very well. You need to predict a little bit. You need to have an idea of what you want to come out of this learning experience, and therefore you need to know what the subject matter is. And dialogical approaches take more time to prepare and conduct. Again, this is a, an issue of complexity, because what you're doing is you're adding voices, you're adding communication, you're adding people's stories to the learning space. And that takes time. It's much easier to impart great areas of knowledge by, one, by just having one voice speak about it, and much more difficult to, or not difficult, but it takes simply longer to elicit it from many voices in the room. This means less banking is possible. And we need to actually very carefully evaluate when banking is necessary, when eliciting is necessary, and when dialogue is necessary to find the right space. And finally, and now I'm getting into an area where I know very, very little about, because all of my courses are courses of about 30 to 60 students, so I very rarely uh, use approaches of large-scale testing. But, um, but the approaches that I've outlined here, the dialogical and the elicitive approaches in particular, do not work very well with large-scale uniform testing, like multiple choice tests. It's very hard to actually test embodied knowledge. It's very hard to test emotional knowledge, um, unless we then design, for example, role plays, again, as testing grounds for that. And that would make it almost impossible to administer to a large group of people at the same time. But um, I think, to some degree, large-scale testing is also a remnant of the Industrial Revolution, just like the banking approach. Um, <clears throat> it only tests the bank knowledge. That's what it's really good for, and not the other knowledge that is important for living in this complex society. So let me slowly come to an end, and, um, and maybe we even have a little bit of time to at least get some of your voices and, um, and questions up and, um, and otherwise, I very much hope to continue this in the break. If you want to use dialogic approaches to education, it's about opening space. And the first thing that an educator then needs to do is, you need to be, dare to be still and let other people speak. You need to acknowledge learners as a resource for knowledge creation. And, um, and rethink the classroom environment, in that it's an environment where I, as the, um, as the facilitator, the educator, whoever opens the space, also come out of changed, where I have learned. It's, in, it's important to hold concepts lightly and to invite critical challenge. So, um, so as teachers, I need to, um, and I, I constantly experience that, I need to be able to actually uh, be challenged and even be able to say, I don't know, or I need to find out. I don't know the way forward. This is so difficult, but let's discuss it together. 
So what I'm using is I'm using reflective and reflexive techniques to encourage the group to come up with ideas to, um, to challenging problems. And, um, and dialogue is not just part of classrooms. It's not just that we think about this when we actually open the door, go into inside the classroom, and the students come in. Um, because as I said in the beginning, the complex system of the school is not just the classroom. The complex system of the school is the playground, is the, um, is the office, is the meeting room, is the teacher's room, is the tuck shop. So using dialogue only in the classroom, but not in some of the decision making, for example, amongst staff, or in the way that, um, that we treat each other in the cafeteria, sends the message that, um, that, this, is not, that this is just a very special approach that, um, that we only need in one little part in our lives. It makes much more sense to embrace dialogue and, um, and network decision-making in larger areas in the school. And again, that doesn't mean everywhere. There are decisions that need to be made by one person, that time-critical um, hierarchies may sometimes only allow for one person to make a particular decision. Things need to get done. But we can rethink some of the other decision-making and open up. And we can even use some of the dialogical learning activities from the classroom in other parts of the school. A wealth cafe doesn't just work in the classroom, it also works in the staff room, where we can actually invite everyone to contribute their ideas, their passions, their innovation, um, to set some strategic direction, to decide what to do with pressing problems that occur in the school. And, um, and surely I can say from my own experience at universities, universities don't do that, not at all, or at least it's very rare that they do so. So my invitation for you is to, um, to try some of this out. To dare to be still, to let others talk, and to trust that they have the knowledge and the wise decision-making that's necessary to make a move forward. And, um, and to see yourself not as someone who has to, to talk a lot to impart knowledge, but someone who simply has to open the space and then wait and see what emerges. Thank you very much.